have purchased our redemption. You have opened up a way of access for us to the Father. And how we praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, that according to your word, you are here with us this day. You are in our midst. Great is thy faithfulness. And we thank you, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We sense, Lord, the hindering power of the adversary this morning. But we thank you that we are not defeated. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are more than overcomers through him who loved us. We break through now, Lord, the obstacle. We break through, Lord, the obstruction. We break through the hindrance. We tear down the wall in Jesus' name. We stretch out towards thee, Lord. We stretch towards the throne of grace. We thank you for the unction and for the anointing, Lord. We thank you, oh God, hallelujah, for how you're touching us even this morning. Oh, glory to God. We thank you that you have defeated, Lord, the enemy. That you reign, Lord God, even now. And we reign with you. Let now this word go forth, O God, in power. Let it minister to your children. Touch the hearts of those who have come, Lord. They have needs. They need to hear a word from you. Send that word now, Lord, to your servant. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning I want to share with you from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1. Beginning at verse 17, the words of the Apostle, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 
not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The phrase that sticks in my mind this morning is this one. The foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of preaching. Verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I am employed now in what I regard as the greatest employment that a man can have on the face of the earth. And that is the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know of any greater employment than a man or woman can be called to than to preach the gospel. For the gospel has in it a power that nothing else has. There is no other employment that a man can occupy himself with of which it can be said that it delivers men and delivers women and saves them. It is only the gospel that does that. How can they hear without a preacher? And so I'm employed in proclaiming the word that releases men and releases women from the captivity in which they were born. I can't think of anything greater than that. Now when Paul talks about the gospel here, he uses a term here, foolishness. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So then, in order for a man to be saved, he is called to believe what Paul called a message of foolishness. Now it is important for us to understand that when Paul talks about the foolishness of preaching, he is not Speaking of the method by which the gospel is delivered. I ran into a man once who thought that what Paul meant was the gyrations and the gestures and the motions and the mechanics of preaching. He said that was the foolishness. So when the preacher gets up here... mm -hmm, and gets his tune and gets a little moan 
somebody said that was of the foolishness of preaching. But God called some of us to preach who couldn't moan if we wanted to. And salvation is not in a moan, it's not in a groan, it's not how you run or how high you lift your foot or how high you raise your voice. When Paul talked about the foolishness of preaching, he was not talking about the method, but he was talking about the content. It is the content of the gospel that Paul calls foolishness according to this world's standards. But it has pleased God. This was not God's plan B in case plan A didn't work. This was not what God resorted to when everything else failed. It pleased God from the very beginning that through the foolishness of preaching, men who believed in the foolishness might be saved. Thank God for the foolishness. Paul does not leave us in any doubt as to what constitutes the foolishness of the gospel. Notice in verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. That is the foolishness of the gospel. Verse 18, he says it again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved. And oh, I love how Paul puts these things. Because you see, I would have expected Paul to say the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us it's wisdom after all wisdom seems to be the opposite of foolishness but Paul has a way of going beyond what we would expect him to say in a situation like this Paul is concerned not to set before us only the wisdom of the gospel. Men do not need simply a display of wisdom. The man that comes to our church, strung out on drugs, drugs has wasted his life. Drugs have destroyed his family. Drugs have destroyed his home and his hope. He needs something more than wisdom. He needs to hear something that promises him some power. Those of us that have wrestled with what Adam has done to us inside, and all of us were like that, don't need to sit down to some philosophical discussion about how God might have done things, but this is why God did it the way he did it. There is a time for that, but when I'm hurting and when I'm in need to make contact with God, I need some power. And Paul says, in this 18th verse, there are two classes of people. And everyone in this room today finds himself in one of these two classes. There are no others. There are those that perish and those that are saved. That's it. Go wherever you want to go on the whole face of the earth and you will find but two categories of people. Those that perish 
and those that are saved. Now I need to share with you what it really says in the original. Those that are perishing and those that are being saved. So people are divided into two classes based on the process that is taking place in their lives at this present moment. Two processes. Perishing is a process. Nothing rots momentarily. It takes a while for a thing to rot. It takes a while for things to decay. Rotting is a process. So Paul says that one category of people are those that are perishing. They are rotting. They are in the process of being destroyed. Then he says there is another class of people. Those that are being saved. We don't use that terminology very often. Somebody says, are you saved? And it's either yes or no. But it is more accurate to say that I am in the process. Someone has begun a good work in me so I can say yes to that. But the work that is begun in me is not yet finished. So when you ask me if I am saved, it depends on what you really mean by that. Because I can say yes, or I can say no, or I can say I'm in the process and be accurate in all three of those things. But it is not my intent to get so bogged up in the process this morning. There is a response that folks make to the gospel. To those that are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, we have found a source of power. It does not rest in me. It does not rest in you. But there is a power that emanates from Calvary. There is a power that emanates from the cross of Jesus Christ. And if I take my eyes off of my ability and my value and my worth and my knowledge and my strength and look away to Calvary, I will find a power that cannot be found anywhere else. And it is that power that emanates from the cross of Christ that saves men. And when I reject the power of Calvary, when I reject what God has done for us from the cross, I get caught up in this process of destruction. Who would have thought that God would have chosen to save the world through this means. The world looks at it and they say, no way. Now as we move further down in the chapter, you notice that Paul talked again about two classes. There was the Jew and there was the Greek. Look at the Jew first. The Jew knew about Messiah. He had read of Messiah in his Old Testament scripture. But the problem with the Jew was that although he knew of Messiah and that Messiah would someday come, the Jew had some preconceptions about what Messiah would be like and what Messiah would do when he got here. They looked for a Messiah that would rule on this earth in power and glory. They looked for a Messiah that would assert his authority and take charge, that would defeat the Roman government, put down all of Israel's enemies, and raise up a kingdom on this earth. That's what they looked for. And when this carpenter's son came, humble and lowly, they said this could not be. 
And even as the disciples walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, I believe that in their hearts there was this question, when's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? Lord, when are you going to stand up and assert yourself? Oh, people are still pushing us leaders today to do that. Stand up and assert yourself. Don't let folks walk over you. Wield the big stick. Come down on the folk. Stand up and assert yourself. But that was the Jews' problem. They were looking for signs. They were looking for evidence. You will remember even when our Lord rose from the dead. Before his ascension. Lord, is this going to be the time? You're going to do it now? You're going to do it? We've seen you humble. We've seen you lowly. We've seen you escaping from crowds. Now's the time, isn't it? You're going to rise now, aren't you? You're going to get on the horse and come into Jerusalem and knock those Roman heads. Aren't you going to do it now? And the answer comes back, it's not for you to know. The times and the seasons that the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come on you and you shall be witnesses. Don't worry about my kingdom. Don't worry about my rule. I got a job to do and you're going to be witnesses and you're going to need my power to do it. You're caught up in the sign thing. There was a man that rose in the days of Paul who promised that he would be able to part the Jordan. And a few thousand crazy Jews went after him. There was another man who took thousands of Jews out and said that at his command, the walls of Jordan, of Jerusalem were going to fall. And he led a thousand, three, four, five thousand folk after him. And the church even today is still open and vulnerable to those men and those women who come in promising signs, who come in promising miracles. But Jesus has told us that that is not the way to deliverance. It's the foolishness of the cross. He said to the Jews of his day, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But he said, I'm going to give you one sign and one sign only. Sign of Jonas. And he rose from the dead and there were those who still did not believe. I want to say to the church this morning that although we have taken advantage of Calvary, we've been buried in the name of Jesus. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. There is that Jewish spirit that still tends to grip some of us. We still want to see signs. And except we see signs, and wonders we will not believe. Somewhere in my Christian experience, I have to understand that God has spoken once and for all at Calvary. That God has opened the way for everything I need done in me and through me to be done. It's through the foolishness of preaching. It's through a Christ crucified. Are you saying there should be no signs and there should be no miracles? I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that those should follow them that believe. Those are only the tools through which we do our work. I don't want to be caught up in signs and wonders and miracles where they become the focus and I lose focus on him who works the signs and the wonders and the miracles. This is not miracle temple. It is Christ's temple. If anybody's church is named miracle, just occurred to me, somebody's church may be named miracle temple. I'm sorry about that. But there needs to be the correct focus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Signs may draw some men. Miracles may draw some men. Fishes and loaves may draw some men. 
But Jesus said, you followed me because you saw the fishes and the loaves. But when the fish supply gets cut off and the bakery closes up, I'll look for you and you'll be nowhere around. I must be able to follow him when there are no fish, when there are no loaves, and my spirit can still say, it is well. It is well! What makes it well? That Jesus has died on Calvary's cross and opened there a fountain for sin and for cleansing. And the indwelling Christ gives me a power in order to be delivered from everything that holds me captive. It is well with my soul. Though hungry, though naked, though wounded, it is well. when I'm continually looking for certain signs when they're not there I have problems grasping the fundamental truths of what the word of God says yes I know you said it Lord but show me something and a lot of us are from Missouri I don't mean naturally you know they call Missouri the show me state so we say, Lord, if you're really with me, show me a sign. And the Lord said, you got my word. Yes, but. I need something surer than that. I need something more dependable than that. Show me a sign. Signs may come and signs may go, but the Lord said, my word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away before my word will. All right. God himself said that he had exalted his word above all his name. And you need something else. God bring us out of that condition of mind where we're continually looking for signs to validate his presence here with us. See, the foolishness of preaching is tough for a man to swallow because he looks at Calvary, that bleeding mass of human flesh on the cross, and God says, that's how I've chosen to save the world. That's Messiah there. Where's the glory? Where's the splendor? It's there. The world has never seen the glory of obedience, unqualified obedience like they have seen at Calvary's cross. You want to see a sign? Look at Calvary. At the Messiah who humbles himself and becomes obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. That's the sign how much God loved me. That's the sign how much God loved you. What else do you need? What can go higher? What can be a greater demonstration of the love? What greater sign than when the king of glory himself the creator of the universe puts on a robe of flesh, comes down among sinful men, and allows himself to be nailed to the cross. What other sign can he give you? Songwriter said, what more can he do? What more can he do? You see, man has trouble with that. We sing the songs. We give the testimonies. But when it comes to applying the benefits of Calvary to our own walk with God, we got problems. But it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. There is no other message. There can be no other message. Crucify. You see, I have problems. We have problems with that in our own lives. Because when you have a problem with a Christ crucified, 
Then you have a problem with the disciple crucified because the Lord said that if you weren't willing to take up your cross and follow him, you could not be his disciple. So we've always got problems with the cross. When I'm carrying my cross, I can't see how the power of God's at work in my life. When I'm carrying my cross, I can't see how the will of God is being worked in my life because we've been brought up in the kind of thinking that a cross means something's wrong with you. That if you were walking in harmony with God, it would be blessing, blessing, blessing all the time. Not so. God deliver us from the bless me plans and the give me plans and all that. Here's a car and here's clothes and here's this and here's that. And we're in here to see how much we can get. But Jesus said, it's not what you get, it's what you're called on to give that makes a man my disciple. And he said before we even followed him, if you're not willing to give everything, including your own life, don't even think about it. We want to ask him the question that Peter asked him, Lord, We've left all to follow you. What soul will we have, therefore? How about pain? How about sorrow? How about an oven, a fiery furnace? How about afflictions? How about tribulations? How about being misunderstood? How about tears? This is what he promises you now who will follow. Foolishness, the stumbling block to the Jew. And I say to you today that the kinds of things that we as children of God go through become stumbling blocks to us as well. Honey, you must have done something wrong. Because surely nobody would be suffering like you are if you hadn't done something wrong. Honey, have you talked to the pastor? Don't you know that the Bible says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me? Don't you know, honey, that the Bible says that he that covereth his sin shall not prosper? But don't you know that the Bible says that he that will live godly shall suffer persecution? says that too in the same Bible. So Lord, deliver me from this mentality that gauges my relationship with God, that gauges my spirituality by all the good things that happen to me. God, bring us into that atmosphere that the blessings can go up or the praises can go up whether the blessings come down or not. In fact, to be in a state of mind where I want blessings to go up, where my soul delights and praise is going up, that's a blessing in itself. Lord, you don't ever have to send a blessing down. There's something in my spirit that longs to praise you. I long to see that. Let him send whatever signs he wishes. But I'm not in this for signs. I don't want to be caught up in the Jewish mentality of looking for signs. And when they don't come, it's a stumbling block. No, I think sometimes we come to church to see a performance. There's nothing happening at our church. Well, you know, if you started praying and fasting... God just might do something through you. Because you see, if nothing is happening at our church, that means none of us are doing anything, and that includes you. Because if you were doing something, you could not say nothing. You might be able to say not much, but you couldn't say nothing. So you indict yourself when you say nothing, and I think the best place to start is with you. But one of the hindrances of the church is we come and we want performances. 
You all want to be the spectators and you want us to perform like puppets up here. Watch me do this. Watch me do that. So you all can run out and say, Oh, the Lord did some mighty powerful stuff at our church this morning. God wants to do some powerful stuff. But sometimes the powerful stuff he wants to do is not in front of everybody, but down in the basement where only one or two know what's going on. Out in the parking lot where not everybody can see it. We want to be seen. We're so concerned with what people think about us. Well, if I can do a few things and folks can see it, then they'll have respect for me. They didn't have respect for Jesus. He healed the sick in front of them. He raised the dead in front of them. He did all kinds of things in front of them, and they still wouldn't believe. God, deliver us from spending time and energy trying to get unbelievers to believe Particularly when the unbelievers are the saints. So the Lord says, I got one message and one basic message only. Call it foolishness if you will. Call it a stumbling block if you will. It's Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Christ crucified in what appeared to be weakness. That's the message. And it pleased God to save men through a crucified Christ. Well, now Paul says we got the Greeks. They got a problem with it. Because they were always looking for something heavy. Something scholarly. Something profound. And sometimes that spirit of profundity grips us ministers. And instead of preaching the simple gospel that transforms lives and delivers men and women out of bondage. We want to sound heavy. We want to sound profound. We want to sound deep. But Jesus was the heaviest man I know. Jesus was the profoundest, deepest man I know. And when he came on the scene, he talked about birds and he talked about sea and he talked about dirt. He didn't get wrapped up in the Greek philosophers and the scholars. He was trying to save folks. So then you see what I have to decide is whether I'm concerned about saving folks or impressing folks. You want to impress folks, get heavy and deep and profound. But when you want to save folks, there is a gospel. The world calls it foolishness. They looked at the cross and the Greeks said, how in the world could God save man through a man who could not even save himself? You heard what they said. He saved others. Himself. He cannot save. But oh, if they had only known that while those words were coming forth out of his mouth, he was at that moment in the process of completing a redemption that would be available for all mankind, a redemption that would even save those who mocked and scorned him. And so the Greek thinking comes into well we don't want to hear them elder so and so is preaching is he deep is he in the revelation one of our preachers I'm told said once somebody asked him once say elder why don't you ever preach and teach from the chart you don't ever preach and teach from the chart I don't. And he said, because what y'all is doing ain't on them charts. We want something deep, profound. And we walk out and we don't know what was said. All we know is deep, deep. But when I've got to wrestle with the devil on Monday morning, I need something that I can put to use right away. I don't have time to interpret the thing and figure it out. I need the power of God at work in me right now. Don't make it too deep. Don't make it too profound. 
In fact, the deepest men I know are those that can take a simple truth and feed it so you understand exactly what's going on. And you can delve into the profound truth of God, but they know how to make it simple. So we need a speaker. Who are we going to get? We need somebody eloquent. We need somebody who knows how to put words together. But Paul said, when I came to you, I stayed away from eloquence. I stayed away from enticing words of men's wisdom. He could have done it. He knew how to put vocabulary together. Paul could have quoted the Greek philosophers and scholars. He studied them and he knew what was going on there. But he said, I don't want you to be impressed with me. I want you to be impressed with Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. There is a foolishness that accompanies the gospel. And when you get away with the fool from the foolishness, you get away from the gospel. What is the foolishness? A Christ crucified. A Christ hanging there, helpless, bleeding, dying, crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the gospel there. And somehow I long to find that key that I can proclaim to addicts and those that are entrapped in sin. I don't need to refer them to some social program. I don't need to give them a 12-step program to follow. I don't need, you know, the, the social agencies of this world have said once an addict and always an addict. Once this and always this. But my Lord Jesus stood in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke and said the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel unto the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Not patch them, heal them. The opening of eyes of those that are blind. Not cloudy vision, but clear vision. Those that are lame, those that are dragging their feet will walk, will leap. That's what he said the gospel does. But before he stopped, he said the opening of the prison to the captives. Here is a man that is captive. The gospel doesn't tell you to get used to your captivity. The gospel doesn't come in and put wallpaper and pictures in your cell. Jesus has a key to every captivity. There is no prison that Jesus can't open. And when Jesus opens your prison, you can say, I once was lost. But now I'm found. I once was blind. But now I see. I once was an addict. But I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 God says, I'm going to do something. The world's not going to be able to deal with it. They're not going to be able to accept it. The world talks about a bloody religion. Let them talk about a bloody religion. But my Bible tells me that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission. The problem with mankind is that he has adopted something that came forth in Clinton's inaugural speech. I don't know whether he did that intentionally or it was through ignorance of the scripture. But he said, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of men what we can do. And I wanted to say, hold it, Clinton. Hold it, Clinton. Go back and check that Paul again because you quoted him incorrectly. That's the problem with mankind is what we can do. It's our programs, our social welfare programs. But look at the mess society is in today. Things aren't getting any better. They're getting any worse. Because we have rejected the foolishness of the gospel. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, if you have a better way, let's see it. 
If you can open the eyes of the blind, do it. If you can set the captive free, do it. But Paul says that God said it pleased him. That's the way he wanted to do it. In fact, so sure was he that this would work, that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. It was as though he stood on that side of eternity and looked through the corridor of history and saw every so-called deliverer and every so-called messiah and every so-called program and said none of them will work. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world, he will do the job. So Paul said, we're not here to impress you. We're here to get you delivered. I'm tired of that spirit that hovers around us preachers that wants to impress folks. And folks walk out of church impressed but still in prison. You don't need to be impressed with me. Be impressed with Jesus. I didn't shed a drop of blood for you. Jesus did. I don't have any power. Jesus has the power. And I can't make it any simpler or any harder than the word says. Through the foolishness of preaching. I thank God the foolishness doesn't have anything to do with the way we deliver. I know there are folks that just through their delivery mechanics can have this church shouting. Y'all be hollering so much you wouldn't even know what he's saying. There's all kinds of stories that circulate about what unscrupulous preachers can do. There's a story that said I can get them shouting. You went in and he didn't say nothing. Coon, coon, folks all shouting. Because we get in harmony with the rhythm. We get in harmony with the melody. We get in harmony with the tune. But I want to be in harmony with the message. When you get in harmony with the message, a man can stand here just about like I'm standing here now and share precious truths with you from the word of God and touch something deep down in your spirit without raising his voice, without going through any emotional gymnastics and gyration, he delivers that word of God in power and unction. And somehow that word of God comes from the throne of glory and penetrates down into the innermost recesses of my being and touches me where I need healing, touches me where I need restoring, And the basis on which he does that is certainly not my faithfulness. It's not my righteousness. But it's based on what he has done at Calvary. Oh, Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Calvary! See what he has done for us at Calvary! The Greeks didn't like it. The Jews didn't like it. But unto us who believe, it is not just God's wisdom, but it is God's power. There is a power in Calvary that sets captives free. There is a power that opens eyes, heals the lame. The power that's there. Glory to God. No wonder Paul said, necessity is on me. Yea, woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. Foolishness of preaching. It has pleased God by preaching of Christ crucified to save them which believe. Let me show you how this works, too. Here's Philip out in the desert. And here's an Ethiopian eunuch sitting in a chair. And the eunuch and Philip says, Understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I accept the man dying? 
So Philip gets up in the chariot and sits down. I see some of y'all wouldn't have stayed two minutes to listen to Philip because when he sat down, y'all have got up and said, I don't think Philip's got the anointed today. Because everybody knows nobody can preach sitting down. But watch what Philip did. Sits down. He says, what you reading there? He says, I'm reading from Isaiah. And I want to know who, who the prophet is speaking about. Is he talking about himself or someone else? And the Bible says that Philip began at the same place and opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. Now, had that been some of us, we'd have said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, somebody get a lectern. Let me get out this, out this chariot. Now, somebody get my preaching gown. I can't preach without my preaching gown on. And somebody go get Brother Hardy and tell him to get an organ out here because the Lord knows I can't preach without an organ. And it would be kind of nice if there was a choir humming softly behind me while I told this man what was in here. Now he just sat down, began at the same place, and so powerful was that gospel that when Philip got through showing him Jesus in Isaiah, that eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? And Philip said, hold it, wait a minute now. I'm not in this for numbers. I don't have to go back to the council and tell them how many I baptized. There is one hindrance. It's not how much you shouted. It's, it's do you believe? Because if you don't believe, we'll tell the chariot driver, drive on. But the man said, I believe. Stop the chariot. And he took him down and baptized him. And all he did was just share the gospel with that man. And I wonder sometimes, you know, if we really got into sharing the gospel and we believed the gospel, then we wouldn't have to. You ought to be baptized. All right. Why you should come on be baptized? Come on, get baptized. You want to get baptized. Don't you know God's calling you? He's drawing you in love. He's drawing you in love. You need to get baptized. <laughs> and I believe a lot of folks have said yes, not out of belief, but out of self-defense. They say, if I don't get baptized, this man's going to kill me. So I'll get baptized and get out of here. And once I go, Lord, if you spare me, I'll never be back in this place again. I may get baptized. I may get the Holy Ghost, but not here. I'm out of here. But there is a power in the gospel. There is a power in the gospel that when it is preached and spoken with the unction of God, it does something to an individual. And that's the means by which God has chosen to save you. And if you're here this morning, I'm going to give the invitation now. I want to know if you believe that gospel. You see, because some of you are saying to yourself, well, Brother Johnson, I know I need to come, but I need to pray more. You haven't heard the gospel. I, I need to think about this more. You haven't heard the gospel. I need to go to church more and read my Bible more. You haven't heard the gospel. It is through the preaching of Christ crucified that God has chosen to save men. Oh, I love that. Because that means the work is already done. And the fact that Jesus rose from the dead shows me that God accepted that. So I can come with confidence. I can come with assurance. I can come with boldness. Is there a man or a woman here today without Jesus?